Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we have a very special guest, and I'm so excited to introduce her. She has been on the scene for the last 45 years and has worked with so many greats, from Joe Henderson to Wayne Shorter, Stanley Clark, Lenny White, Prince, Janet Jackson, yes, and even Carlos Santana. She is a keyboardist, producer, vocalist, uh, arranger. She does it all. She's a genius. Please welcome to the show... Miss Lady Fingers or Baby Fingers. <laughs> you know, I know, I know Baby Fingers is your nickname, Patrice. I had to, I had to do that one. But, uh, but no, uh, it, it's so good to have you on today. You know, we, uh, like I said, you've been on the scene for over 45 years, as I said, and you've played uh, on countless records. You've uh, made so much wonderful music that we all love. But uh, curious a little bit uh, as far as your background, knowing uh, more about that. I understand that you are from what, Watts, Los Angeles? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, tell I'm us, Los Angeles. Okay, tell us a little bit about your background, how you found music, because I believe our, uh, you started at a very year, uh, early age playing piano. Yeah. Uh, so both my parents worked. There's six years between my younger sister and I. So okay. I was the only child for a few years. Okay. And when my parents were working, they, you know, had me in a uh, nursery school program. And it was the teacher in that program who was very musical, as I look back on it, you know, now, uh, and included a lot of music and dance activity as part of our regular day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During that time, that's when I would really, she noticed that I would really, you know, really spark up. And she told my parents about a program that was designed for young children that happened to be at the University of Southern California. It was a graduate course for music education majors Yeah. who were at that time observing young children. That's before the whole push towards early childhood development and having the Suzuki method and the Yamaha method for little mm -hmm. kids in mm -hmm. this country. So they were still developing theories and ideas about these kids who seem to be gifted in music did they hear the same did they were they able to it could you give them a language to be able to converse and talk about and move their body to music and all this type of stuff anyway i was involved in this program called eurythmics mm. and what you would do is you'd go through that for a couple of years and then they would invite you to take up an instrument and so piano was chosen for me and that was at five years old, and wow. I learned, I went through this same program and learned to uh, play piano and took theory and all these kinds of things. You know, they were very good at being able to just take young children and just keep keep having them progress. We didn't know exactly what the, what the methodology was at the time, but it did mm -hmm. allow for us to make a lot of progress and to meet some other like-minded uh, kids, like-minded artists. And yeah. Like program until I was 17. That's incredible. Patrice, uh, did your parents expose you guys to like a lot of music growing up? I mean, what were you what were you guys listening to in the house? Definitely. At home, we were hearing jazz, we were hearing gospel, uh, we were hearing Latin music, everything. They belonged to a record club. They didn't play in the uh -huh. instrument, but they loved music and they supported the music. The radio was on all the time. Television was on all the time. We always had a, a you know, the record players used to have a spindle and you could put multiple albums on this spindle and they would just drop down. One would finish yeah. and two would drop down. So all day, on weekends especially, uh, we would have music playing all day. So I heard so much just as part of our upbringing. There was music everywhere. And in school, and this is a big point, that in the public schools, we had music as just part of the regular education. So mm. by the time I got to middle school, there was like a band and a choir and all that type of thing. I remember I had been playing piano, but I wanted to play something I could play in the band or the orchestra. So I learned how to play flute so I could participate in that. And then by the time I got to high school, there were many things that we could do uh, as music majors, because then you could start to kind of vary off into what it is that you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And in the high school where I went, it was a bit, there was a very, very dynamic uh, music program. Now, you went to Locke High School. I understand that uh, Gerald Albright went to the same school as you. Did you guys go together at the same time? Yeah. Gerald wow. was, like, he was a couple of years behind us. But the junior high school that, that fed into Locke, one of the biggest junior high schools that fed into it, was right across the street. So even before Gerald was a student at Locke, he would come over 
to be able to play with us. You know, we were just a couple of years older, so he would come over to play with us. So, yeah, quite a few people came out of there. And Dugu Chancellor was uh, a student there at the time. Myself, uh, the guys who play horns with Earth, Wind & Fire. Yeah, Gary Bias went there, too. Yeah. Uh, Reggie Young went there. So there have been a lot of people who have come out of th that school and that particular area mm. uh, during that time and since. Mm, incredible. Now, uh, Patrice, uh, I believe it was during high school, weren't you involved in some type of talent contest and you guys won something and you were able to play at the Monterey Jazz Festival? Yeah. Tell us about that. That must have been an incredible experience at such oh, a young age. Game changer. Game changer. It, um, we used to enter quite a few Battle of the Bands types of things. You could win mm -hmm. things like that. And, and in our school, you know, we could always use extra extra stuff. And it was great experience uh, to be able to prepare for something and then go and do the music and, and, and get feedback. Yeah. So one of the things that we entered was this uh, uh, Monterey had a, a high school program where different high schools with their big bands would uh, submit uh, music and try to win uh, a performance at the main Monterey Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. So we entered this thing and there was a subcategory for combos. And I just entered the contest, you know, with a sextet. Uh, wow. the, 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 the big band didn't win, but the combo did. So we won a spot to be able to play on the Monterey Jazz Festival of 1972. Wow. And, and um, after that, you know, I was seen uh, by a lot of people and things just started happening with the idea of perhaps a record deal or something like that. I was about to go to college, you know, the next year. So the last thing on my on my list was, you know, to, to, to be involved in any kind of uh, uh, contract or anything like that. But I did need money to go to school, so, um, it was an, an interesting time to be able to observe, you know, how I could manage uh, to do both. And Fantasy Records had a label, a jazz label called Prestige, mm -hmm. short-term deal. And they, uh, you know, offered me a little bit of money and just said, listen, you'll have creative control, take your time, do, you know, and... Uh, they were up in the Bay Area, which is not far from Los Angeles. And yeah. so a lot of things about it made it an easy, easy transition into that very gradually, you know, sort of to stick my toe in type of thing. So it worked out okay. Interesting. Now, when did you realize that you had a voice? Were you singing at an early age or when did the whole singing start coming in? Because I'm like, wow, you know, very talented. You're a great keyboardist. You have a great voice. Uh, you could have just made it just being a jazz singer, you know? <laughs> Seriously. I, I laugh at that because still, to this day, Preston, to this day, I don't really see myself as a singer at Really? See, that's amazing to me. I, wow. like to sing. I like to sing. I've always liked to sing, but usually it was, um, yeah, I had always uh, kind of looked at it as, as an, as, as an uh, extension, as a means of expression and to get my point across. Mm. So I, could, I could sing in tune. I could definitely sing different intervals, you know, I could put stuff together and, and like that. I started singing on the albums just again as an as a means of expression. Another 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 instrument, if you will, that would allow for the particular piece to come together. And yeah. people started liking that and wanted more of that. Mm -hmm. So I did that. You know, I did I did I did more of it. Um but it is still, it, it, it cracks me up because it's like, I love to do it, but it's not as if I, I would, I would wear that, that moniker that easily because uh, I've been a right. amazing and a big oh. singer. Oh, I know you have, you know, I was thinking about uh, someone that you've worked with, you know, later in your career, like Carmen Lundy. I had her on the show a couple of weeks ago. What a brilliant artist. I mean, this lady does everything. She's one of the only jazz singers that I've ever talked to that writes all of her own music, arranges it. She's a visual artist. She, I mean, she does everything. Just incredible. But uh, 1974 was a pivotal year for you. You came out, you came out with this, and you signed this for me when I saw you uh, at uh, in Bethesda Blues Jazz and stuff. I love this recording. Uh, some really uh, nice uh, cuts on it. And uh, you worked with, what was it like working with Joe Henderson? I mean, you had some big names on that recording. Yeah. Well, that was the first, that was the first album for Prestige. And 
as was uh, pretty routine yeah. for companies when you would have a new artist. Uh, you would try to pair them or put them in the company of, uh, of a more established artist mm -hmm. in order to draw eyes and ears to this new artist's stuff, right? Right, right. So, Anderson, we were label mates. He was on. He was on the label. Okay. And when Oren Keatonews, who was the executive producer at the time, when he says, "Okay, well, we want to uh, figure out, you know, who we would like to have on this record as of a, that is that has a name that maybe maybe on the label that would uh, do a guest spot on this in order to again bring eyes towards you." Mm -hmm. so, he said, so, so he said, "So how about Joe Henderson?" And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, I'm straight up Joe Anderson fan. So I was like, well, if, if that can happen, that'd be awesome. And yeah. they made it happen. And he came in, he was so gracious, so yeah. nice, played his butt off. I mean, it was like really, it was really a, a special moment, a special moment for me. Yeah, incredible. I mean, who were some of your influences during that time? Because when I listen to you, I can definitely hear some Herbie, uh, some Chick. Uh, definitely hear a, a huge uh, Herbie Hancock influence. I mean, Maiden Voyage is one of uh, his best Herbie, so that's like the greatest you know, song that I ever wrote. But I can definitely hear some of those influences. I mean, was Herbie a big influence on you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think by the time that, that I had enough of a uh, musical vocabulary, I guess, to start, discern start discerning what it was about different players that I liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's about the time that that connect I made that connection between his sound and things about his sound that I found uh, very attractive. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, as I got more into Herbie, I actually went backwards and listened more to some of his influences: Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, Milton Kelly. Yeah. On and so forth. You know, I was always aware of. You know what was going on with Herbie and Chick and Keith Jarrett, McCoy Tyner. McCoy Tyner. Yeah. They all kind of represented a an era for me that uh, was just in front of what it was that I could see for myself. Mm -hmm. All of them very versatile. All of them uh, having a certain um, commonality in terms of having studied classical music, beautiful sound on their instrument. Mm -hmm. so, uh, interesting improvisational skills where you could definitely hear the tradition, but you could also hear that they listened to other things. Yeah. And that was like uh, really attractive, you know, for me as, as, as looking to that. And then later on, George Duke and people like this. Yeah. Gradually, and as I would go to see them, they would come into my life in different ways over and over. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, we played a lot of those contests. Sometimes my heroes were people that actually were adjudicating those contests, like Quincy Jones or Oliver Nelson. Wow. Or Benny Golson. And these are people that I came in contact and then would come in contact with them again and again and again as I was growing. So they, mm -hmm. both of them took me very seriously from the, from the beginning and, and were very supportive. Yeah, because you hit the scene at a time when fusion was big. You know, Mahavishnu Orchestra, Weather Report, Return to Forever. All those guys were doing it. Herbie Hancock, Headhunters. So what a what an incredible time for music. Now, after a Prelusion, you uh, made a few more uh, recordings on that label. And then in 1978, uh, you uh, did, did you sign another contract with another record label? Yeah, my and, deal with, with, with uh, Prestige ended. Yeah. And about that time, Electra. Uh, one of, part of the Warner's group mm -hmm. was looking to augment uh, their particular label, uh, Electra Asylum, which had been sort of the boutique Laurel Canyon, yeah, uh, you know, label the Linda Ronstadt's and the Motley Crues and the Jackson Browns and this. Mm -hmm. They had a very, very, very successful uh, run with groups like that and artists mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were looking also, for whatever reason, to expand into what they were calling at that time sort of an urban market. Yeah. So to do it, however, with the personality of 
people who came from the jazz tradition but who had commercial sensibilities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I was signed around the same time as Lee Rittenauer. Oh wow. Lenny White, Dee Dee Bridgewater. Mm, big names. Donald yeah. Bird and the Blackbirds. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else was on the label? Grover Washington. Grover Washington, yeah. First signing. And in their minds, we all fit that in different iterations of that idea. Coming from a certain jazz tradition, but young enough to have commercial uh, sensibilities that could be infused in the music without a feeling forced and without a feeling weird. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, for me, it was just a, a logical uh, a logical step. Yeah. Take advantage of, of of the situation because that's kind of where I was coming from anyway. I loved uh, so many different kinds of music. I wanted to be a, 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 a film composer for film and TV. So devouring the vocabulary of all these different kinds of music for me was very um, natural and, yeah. and it felt good for me. So. Yeah, uh, and you know one of my favorite songs by you probably of all time is uh, Have you heard. I love that. And I'm like, because I mean, when I heard it, and then I listened to it. And then years later, I'm like, I said, Kurt Franklin is stealing Patricia's song. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, looking for you. And I'm like, what a great tune. And I think that was probably the recording where you started singing, I believe, too. You didn't really oh. sing on the other earlier jazz uh, records, but. I didn't sing on the jazz, but I sang one song the whole time I was at Electra. I mean, uh, Prestige, I think I sang the, on the last album, I sang one song. And then on the Electra albums, I, 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 was, I was singing a little bit more because that's what they wanted me to do. Right, right. It, it, it started caught, it kind of caught on and I was, uh, it's funny because I took a lot of heat from the, from the jazz community. When yeah, the, the purest. Electra, when the Electra album started to, to, to catch on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was an interesting time, you know, to be able to observe, you know, wow, you know, what what was going on with the music at the time. Now, again, this is where being able to have uh, strong support uh, really mattered. Mm -hmm. I could see people before me who were also venturing out into other kinds of, 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 of ways to, 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 to increase the palette of what could be looked upon as being from the jazz tradition, uh, you know, and, and I saw that they were doing it with no fear. So that's what I said. Well, I'm just going to do what I do the very best that I can. Right. Um, and if people, if people accept it and enjoy it, I don't care what they call it. Exactly. So let's get moving. Yeah. You know, other, other artists experienced that same thing. Um, I was, uh, I interviewed Maurice White of Earth, Wind & Fire many years ago, and he told me when they first hit the scene, he said they had the same problem. People kept trying to market them as an R&B band. He said, we're not an R&B band. He said, we're jazz musicians who play popular music. We play everything. And uh, Herbie Hancock had the same problem, too, uh, with Headhunters and some of his other stuff. They're like, Herbie, you sold out. He says, no, man, this is, this is just music, you know? But, uh, yeah, but, you know, you're, I was going to tell you, you have a bass player uh, named uh, Freddie Washington. Mm -hmm. He's always coming up with these hooks for your songs, and I guess it was the same thing for having you heard. I mean, the dude's just working at bass, and then boom, you guys just have something. And I guess it happened again later on when you guys did Forget Me Nots. He comes up with these incredible bass lines, and you guys have this hook, and it just turns into something. But I love the story that you told uh, when you guys did that song. It's almost like you knew that there was something to that. And I guess the record companies at first were like, uh, I don't know if we like this, but you know, you guys promoted it, did everything that you needed to do. And guess later on, the record companies gave you your money back. Yeah. You know how you pushed that. I thought that was beautiful. How you stuck in there and you, you fought for that. You knew it was a good song. Well, you know, sometimes I think what, what by that time, by the time Forgive Me Nots came out, we had seen several songs that were poised to do a lot better if you if you count chart numbers and at that time mm -hmm. you had to because mm -hmm. chart numbers was the measuring stick for how much promotion dollars you could get to go on tour or anything mm -hmm. all that stuff was tied together yeah so when we saw certain records prior to forget me nots come just short of not making a certain criteria that would have allowed for me to be able to, to tour more often or to 
ultimately do videos and all of that kind of thing. Uh, it took about three times, and then we said, you know what? We're going to have to take a more active role Yeah. in knowing a, before the record comes out the kinds of things that we need to be able to do to get it in front of people. You can't make people love it if they don't, but you got they got to have the option to hear it to decide. Mm-hmm. So we had definitely, like we always did, we did our homework. We had already taken it to some clubs and had a couple of our friends who were DJs, you know, stick this in there, let's watch the dance floor. And when we saw the floor just come together and not or not empty out when they were hearing new music, then we knew that there was something there. So we went into the meeting with that record very confident. Mm-hmm. And the record company was like, well, we don't hear anything on this. Now, this album had Remind Me on it, and Number One was on it. And it was a great album, man. It on it and stuff like that. So we, at least we walked out of there having a sensibility about a plan to at least get it to radio. And once we did that and it got in front of people, people took care of it. It took off. But that was one of those aha moments where you realize that sometimes the body politic that is in charge yes. is, out, is out of touch. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Patrice, your vocals were so tight on that. I mean, everything that you sang on there was like so good. And as a matter of fact, I'm always playing Where Is The Love. That's, oh boy, <laughs> that one gets me every time. It's just the music and, and everything is just... I said, she did such a, a fantastic job with this. Now, during that same time, too, I guess a little bit before late 70s, you uh, met and worked with Prince a little bit. Tell us about that experience. What was that like? I mean, how did what was your perception of him during that time? And, of course, later on, we look down and like, this guy's a, a genius. But what was your perception of him during that time when you started working with him? Uh, we met because we had a mutual friend and an engineer named Tommy Bacardi. Okay. And Tommy, I think, had met, had been working with Prince and, and, and was working with me. And he says, you know what? There is somebody I, I really want you to, that you should know. There's somebody who knew, and he wants to know you. And his name is Prince. And he's a, like you. He's a multi-instrumentalist. And he writes and he does all this stuff. And you guys, I just feel like y'all should meet. So we met over the phone. And, you know, Prince was not necessarily a man of a lot of words, especially especially then. Right. But he did have a good rapport. And he was um, into the music. He really liked my music. So uh, maybe a year passed or so, and periodically he would call me. And he would want to know very specifically, what was that instrument? How did you do so-and-so and so? Blah, blah, blah. Our conversations continued. He would co- We actually ended up on uh, several television shows together. We, weren't, we were filming on the same day. Mm. The shows may not have been aired the same day, but we were filming on the same day. So we kept running into each other and had these encounters. And he asked me on his first uh, album to organize the strings on a song called Baby. Mm -hmm. And that's what really started the musical uh, rapport, you know, that we had. And we just stayed in touch. And at key moments, you know, uh, throughout his life, at key moments, uh, we would we would we would connect you know i'd see him at obviously grammy awards and things like that but i also just before purple rain came out you know he called me and he says we happen to be staying in the same hotel in in new york and he called and he wanted to talk about that he was very very nervous about that Mm. those kinds of conversations and that was the kind of very special rapport that we had even though we didn't see each other a lot We, we seemed to be in contact with one another at, at sort of milestone and pivotal moments. Now he went on to be this great, amazing, you know, uh, 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 superstar of a talent, but he always, he mm-hmm. always had that. And there was a vulnerable side to that because I think that uh, regardless of what we saw in terms of his character as an artist, mm-hmm. he still had the same kind of sensibilities and vulnerabilities and insecurities as a lot, as most artists have. So sometimes yeah. I, we were able to talk about those kinds of things. And so it was a very special, a special report that we had. Then again, years later, my first Grammy Awards as music director yeah. was an award show that he and Beyonce opened the show. I remember that. Yeah. And so it was moments like that where our paths continued to cross. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I had uh, the kind of rapport with him that, that I did have. Yeah, you know, and 
everyone still wonders, you know, I want to be your lover. Was that, <laughs> was that, for, was that for you? Was that about you? Well, now y'all found out the same time I did. I opened, the, I opened the CD cover and I'm like, yo, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that was, uh, that was something that was really something. And let me ask you a question in regard to, um, recording, you know, if you're, if you're making a, a record, what is that like as opposed to scoring a film you know, if you're writing uh, music for a, a, you know, like a movie score for a film, what is what is the difference between those two? Well, when you're making a, a record, it's typically a reflection of your uh, specific artistry, what you mm -hmm. want to say. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's like a, a chapter in your book. Mm -hmm. When you're writing music for a film, that's a collaborative effort, and it's an it's an it's an effort of service. Yeah, you are serving is the story. It, 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 is, it is very, very much like an actor coming in, doing that, reading, reading their lines and taking on the character and then being able to be creative within the parameters of the story and within the parameters of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. The music is a character in the film as well. The idea, however, is where visuals are very literal and are edited together. We don't hear music like that. We hear music as, as a long line, start, middle, finish. Mm -hmm. and, in a, and in the context of a movie, some of the best scores are the ones where you're not really aware of it because it becomes a part of the atmosphere and it helps to point the drama yeah. or the comedy or whatever it is. It helps to point it where the, be another asset to where the director and storyteller wants you to see certain things. So there's a lot of attributes to to that, plus the parameters of timing, mm -hmm. you, as a musician, uh, are not in control of any of it. So it's a different kind of skill. Mm -hmm. very much so. Some people don't like it at all because of the parameters being that strict and how creative you can be within a box that you didn't create. But um, it is it can be also a very creative challenge, one in which can serve uh, the movie in such a way that really helps the emotion and really is a part of the uh, kicks, kicks it over the edge. I happen to like that challenge, yeah. uh, but I also do enjoy the idea of being in, being in the studio and creating my own uh, stories as well. But I always love interpreting uh, other people's music. I always love being part of someone else's idea to be able to be given permission to infuse my own uh, ideas on top of theirs or along with theirs or whatever it is that they would want me to do. I enjoy that kind of challenge. It's like having colors in your coloring box and somebody gives you the outline and you figure, do I want red or do I want green? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know, speaking of uh, interpreting other people's music, uh, one of the greatest artists you've ever worked with, uh, along with Prince, is Wayne Shorter. One of the I mean, I don't even know what to say about Wayne, one of the greatest composers ever. Uh, 1988, I think you work with him, Carlos uh, Montro, and you guys were jamming on Elegant People, and I, you did a, an amazing solo. I was watching, and I'm like, boy, that, that was incredible. Uh, what was it like working with Wayne? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. See, I have been a Wayne Shorter fan forever. This is yeah. my heroes as a composer, as an improviser, as a jazz musician, just one of the people that I had been listening to for for such a long time. So that yeah. to, be, to be in his presence was already like, mm -hmm. as I got to know him, and, and especially because we spent so much t you know time together on that tour, you see he's right. hysterically funny, dry sense of humor, just comes out of nowhere with, with things that you, you think about, and then later in the day you go, oh, you know, it's all <laughs> kinds of things that are going on with him. Um, but playing with him every night was a joy because I had to listen and I'm, I'm like this observing participant, you know what I mean? I'm learning, just watching, just being there. Best seat in the house, right there with him. And everything that he would play and the kinds of moments that would occur, uh, not only with the rest of the band, but between the two of us, it was inspiring. Mm -hmm. So. And then you get to play elegant people, which is like the <laughs> jam. Yeah. And man, it was an, it was incredible that that whole tour, and being able to again observe how two what most people would 
would see as disparate dots. Carlos Santana, iconic, you know, pop rock guitar icon. Wayne Shorter, jazz icon and composer. Most yeah. people not see how the two of those people would even know each other, let alone be able to put a band together and create. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those, an, an, another one of those validations that music on a high level is music on a high level. You can call it whatever you want to. You can, but the lines are always blurry between artists, which is why you see uh, so many artists who, you mentioned Carmen Lundy, who do other other things for their expression. Yeah. You yeah. know, music being one, art being another. Some people like to cook. Some people paint. Some people. That is not a surprise, and it is not an accident. It's mm -hmm. as people become more and more aware of of of, of excellence and artistry, and that they resonate together. And it doesn't matter what you do. That truth, we find each other. Mm, yeah, yeah. Now you uh, later in your career, I guess this was probably what. Uh, 80s or 90s, maybe 80s, you uh, worked with, um, what's the big record producer from Arista? Um, Clive Davis. And uh, that, that, that situation didn't work out too well. You know, I'm looking at you, you're a, a jazz artist who plays all different types of music, but was Clive looking for sort of like a pop star? Because, you know, he was working with Whitney Houston and other people. Is that, was he trying to turn you into something like that, which wasn't, that, that wasn't really who you were? Mm -hmm. Um. I think my, my take on it is that Clive Davis had always had a very keen eye for talent. I think he was always enamored and capable of mm -hmm. discerning good, better, best. Yeah. But by the time, by the time Arista became a part of, you know, my trajectory, um, I think that there had been uh, some formula, I don't know what it was, but some formula that they were always accustomed to applying mm -hmm. that had a lot to do and more so to do with Clive's sensibilities than the, than the artist's attributes and sensibilities. So okay. there was, as long as those two things were, either, were aligned or as long as his point of view became the way that the artist came up to that point of view and met that point of view, mm -hmm. I think everything worked out beautifully. Mm. But I had already been accepted doing a particular thing. Yeah. And I think Clive, while he really appreciated that thing, for whatever reason, there was the need to try to control that thing. And in trying to do that, it was going to be a mismatch. I was... Mm. I don't think we had the same agenda about yeah. music, and I know that by the time I got to Arista, my rapport with radio, my rapport with uh, program directors at radio, my rapport with my audience had more or less been firmly established, and so it wasn't natural to take it out of there. It, it, it may, it, it, and I don't know that I was that we ever worked long enough for us to find that, a, a balance because I was so miserable having waited three years right. for, for the one album to come out while he was looking for the big hit that, you know, it was uncomfortable for me. So I asked to be released. And, you know, it was a, it was a thing because people were like, well, okay. We can we can count the number of times that you know people it didn't work out or people didn't get along or people didn't didn't acquiesce necessarily to the way they worked and their careers went downhill. But I had something else to do. Yeah. And that's yeah. and I leaned during those years. I leaned more heavily on that. That's where the idea of scoring Hollywood Shuffle and mm -hmm. Robert Townsend stuff and and the music. That was great. Movie ideas the music direction thing took hold you know because i i knew that that for me for me was going to be a dead end for me now for other people it worked out really 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 well but i think for every super success that we see that was created by 
the Clive Davis machine. There were a lot of people also who were left on the ground. Good point. Now, uh, Patricia, I wanted to ask you about this honorary doctorate that you received from Berkeley College of Music. That, that was fantastic. I mean, what what was that like for you to, to get that? Plus, I know you love to teach too, but what was it like uh, receiving that award? Oh man, that incredible! I had been uh, I had been to Berkeley uh, prior to that to do just you know as a, as a, as a visiting guest, you know, of, of some of my friends who taught there. And when I got the honorary doctorate, it was, it was really heartfelt. I received mine the same day that Steve Gadd and Abraham Laborde mm -hmm. And we had a chance to converse and play together that day. It was a beautiful, beautiful time. And Berkeley as an institution, particularly uh, back then, was still uh, the preeminent institution for any, any area right. of contemporary music and any area particularly of jazz. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a real honor to be then uh, consi considered and then to be on a list of, of uh, honorary uh, uh, doctoral candidates and to receive that honor. It's one that I am very proud of still. And uh, I go back and forth. Now I'm their ambassador for artistry in education. I have That's been fantastic. just past, just after that time. I think I started with that title in maybe 2000. Six or two thousand seven, mm -hmm. and um, continue to do that, and uh, you know continue to work uh, with the school, and it has expanded uh, my interest in education uh, and made for an awareness with other institutions uh, of me as a resource, given the variations in the career that I've had that I've mm -hmm. had in terms of all these varied activities which have all come together now as being very important and, 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 and in developing and de helping develop curriculum that allows for students to get the skill sets yes that allow for the music to to keep on moving mm. now since this uh, covid 19 has hit i mean it's devastated uh the music industry uh so many people i guess are streaming their concerts no one can really tour uh, but what's next musically for uh, Patrice Russian? You know, as you're sitting around, maybe waiting, possibly you know, go back out on tour again. What are you working on anything right now? Writing anything? What's what's going on in that mind of yours musically? Well, uh, you know, one of the things about being at home a lot is that you know it it has done it has been there have been certain positives that have come out of it. First of all, is that you actually do slow down. Yeah. When you slow down and you have to start thinking about certain kinds of things and it starts to help you understand and rebalance and reshape what's important. So it's been it's been busier than I thought I it would be because I had a lot of things to have to kind of adjust for school. I'm the chair of the popular music program at University of Southern California. Okay. So there were adjustments that we were gonna have to make in anticipation of what fall could look like, you know, what the next semester would look like once we had finished uh, getting through last semester. Mm -hmm. But I think what you find out is as you settle into that, you have more time. And right now, I think I'm just now kind of coming into that kind of settling attitude where I can begin to be creative myself. So it's been mm -hmm. nice to be able to practice every day. Yeah. It's been really good. I have some new new uh, equipment that I've been tinkering around with, learning, uh, some software that I had that I never really had the time to dive deeper into that I can do that and all of these things are gradually turning those uh, creative juices uh, back on to be able to do some more music so uh, I don't know what, it, what that means yet but I've been I've started a couple of orchestral pieces I have, oh, wow. I have uh, some actually a couple of things coming up where I think they're gonna be virtual concerts oh. where it's a small group quartet and mm -hmm. we're gonna see how that goes so you know you refit you figure yeah. out other things to do, but the idea is to keep it flowing. And, and artists, I think at this time, at any time, there, there, there are certain uh, uh, limits and uh, things like this. You know, we feel things so deeply in, in what we do. As we figure out how we're going to keep, keep doing things and keep managing things, it becomes somewhat of, I think, um, uh, an example Mm -hmm. What's possible and may give other people, you know, hope that, you know, it ain't over. 
there are things to do. You just got to continue to reboot and recalibrate and find ways not to stop. Uh, Patrice, I'm curious. Uh, if I was just hanging out with you right now and we were sitting down maybe at your house having a meal or just chilling and talking, what type of music do you listen to when you're home? Or what, what you know, if, if I were to look at uh, your playlist, who are you listening to? What are you listening to? You know, it's all over the place, Preston. It depends on the mood I'm in. And sometimes yeah. I don't really plan it. Sometimes, you know, I think one of the greatest things uh, that we have, you know, with the internet, et cetera, et cetera, is that, you know, you can set, you can just put your thing on iTunes or Spotify or whatever you use. Right. And just let her rip. <laughs> right, and you right. don't know what's going to come up, you know? <laughs> and you'll hear something and, oh, you know, it'll start a whole thing. Yeah. Uh, most recently, probably in the last week or so, week or two, for whatever reason, and I, I, I don't, I can't give you one in what specific, but I've been listening to Sly Stone. Uh. Right, I'm right now having a Sly Stone moment, and I don't know, I love Sly Stone, always mm -hmm. have, I don't know where that's coming from with me, just like in, the, in this last week, I have found myself just when I'm, whatever else I'm doing, cleaning up, da da da. Right. I, that's what I'm listening to. I, Fly. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. That's good stuff. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, you've also worked with some other people too. Uh, you, uh, I guess you did some stuff with Stevie Wonder. What, what was that like working with Stevie? Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I've been involved with things, projects where he's come in and there was this record that we did together with Lionel Hampton. The Lionel Hampton? Oh, wow. Amazing. And Joshua Redman was on it. Great sax player, yeah. And the reason that I remember the session so well is because we did it on Christmas Eve. One late, what, late Christmas Eve. And that's the first time that I had been in the recording studio as a player hearing something that Steve, Steve was writing right. for Lionel Hampton's record. And Although I had been around him a lot before then, you know, over the years and doing projects and seeing him and being a fan and talking to him on the phone and all that, that was one of the first times where I was in his presence as he was creating in the moment. And it's a different situation when you actually witness the mechanics, so to speak, uh, those spiritual mechanics of, mm. of, of genius right in front of your face. And uh, he's an amazing uh, musician, amazing artist, and he's been an amazing person and a, a real, a real supporter. And I'm really, I'm happy to know him. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a major fan, and have been for a long time. But um, yeah, he's been, a, he's been a good friend. Well, Patrice, you're amazing, and I want to thank you so much for being on Jazz Talk. I'm so glad you took some time out. Uh, just to share with us today. Uh, we love you. I've had so many people asking this week, said, Preston, when, when is, when is she going to be on the show? When is she? I said, she's going to be on just, just chill. <laughs> so, but uh, no, I wanted to thank you so much for being on the show today and uh, love your music, love you. And just look forward to, uh, you know, future projects. Hang on. I'm about to close out the show. Okay. Well, you've heard it from Patrice Russian. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, again, just uh, thanks so much. Please um, just keep making the wonderful music that you're making. And I was just sitting here thinking about for the last 45 years, everything that you've done. Um, is there any artist that you say you'd like to work with that you've never worked with before? Um, maybe some artists like, man, again, I, gosh, I really would like to work with them, but I just haven't had that opportunity. We haven't connected because there's so many great musicians out there and you've played with some of the best, you know, like you've been associated with Herbie and, you know, um, Wayne Shorter and so many, you know, someone who I would have loved to see you play with Jocko Pastorius. Ooh, well, I, like you know, I, I, I met Jocko. I was, I was at the studio. He was, re he was recording.